As a reminder, Daniel chapter 4 is uh, a letter that Daniel included in his writing that was written by the emperor of Babylon. This was the golden head at the top of the statue Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. This was uh, in the dream that we read about last week, the great tree that gave sh shade and food and shelter to everyone in the whole earth. The Babylonian empire is arguably the greatest empire that ever was. There are others that because of reason of scholarship and reason of bias, probably would feel differently. But the scripture indicates that of all human empires, Babylon was the greatest. It sits atop the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It is reflected in the great tree all that came afterward were less than gold. The gold head, the silver chest, the bronze girdle, and then the iron legs, and then the feet mingled of iron and clay. This Nebuchadnezzar, which we last week mentioned was an evil king, not at all a good man. God confronted him with four men. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These four men made such an impression because God demonstrated himself to Nebuchadnezzar through them. We don't know what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after the fiery furnace, but we know they survived it. We know that King Nebuchadnezzar made a decree that anybody who says anything against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God would be cut into little pieces. We also know his reaction to a dream that God gave him and the fulfillment of the dream in which Nebuchadnezzar became insane because in pride, he continued to push back against God. And even though God had told him and warned him in a dream, had given him a chance, King Nebuchadnezzar filled with arrogance, filled with pride, was walking along the wall and was insulted by what Daniel had told him. And he says, well, isn't this Babylon? Didn't I build this city? And when he pushed back against God, after all God had done to reveal himself to him, he was struck with insanity. And seven years, he was cast out of the kingdom. And seven years, he ate grass to keep himself alive and his hair grew long like eagle's feathers, the Bible says, and his fingernails like the talons of a bird. This man became extremely crazy. We pick up in Daniel chapter four, verses 34 to 37. As Nebuchadnezzar says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out 
and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. You could not get a better testimonial than this of the power of God. The man who arguably ruled the greatest empire that has ever existed on the face of this earth humbled himself before Almighty God and the very nation that God used him to punish is now the very nation that supplies him with the understanding and knowledge of God. I want to talk about the pattern that we see here in Nebuchadnezzar's life as his sanity is restored to them. But first of all, I want us to pause and think about the insanity this world is in right now. Pause and think about that. The political insanity that we witness on the news every day. The financial insanity of businesses that are running themselves out of business in the name of trying to save their business. The social insanity of people who see other people as objects to be used and to be accessed or to be disposed of or put away if they do not happen to match physical or personal goals that individuals have. Consider the personal insanity that people have of trying always to fill an empty void in their lives with things, with shopping, with spending of money, of time, of effort, for those things which do nothing but decay, rust, and corrupt. Jesus urged us to do something different. He urged us to set our hearts on things above, not on things below. To work for treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves do not break in and steal. John Wesley, who started the Methodist movement for all of the work he had ever done, left behind only a few things, a couple of books and six silver spoons. Give one each to the men that carry my coffin. He died a poor man and left nothing behind except the Methodist Church, many missions, uh, songbooks, and all kinds of equipment for the church. A tremendous man of God whose legacy was not in physical things, but whose name we still know today because of the impact he made. And the world would call him insane for having nothing at the end of his life to show financially that he had been here. But we believe him to be one of the most sane men that ever lived. Because at the end of his life, he has blessed generations and generations. Let's take a look at this pattern that we see in Nebuchadnezzar's sanity as it is restored. First of all, 
He says it begins with heaven. He says, as I looked to heaven, my sanity was restored. In Deuteronomy 5, verse 32, you're welcome to turn with me if you would like. But in Deuteronomy 5, verse 32, we read, So be careful to do whatever the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. A very simple verse, a very simple truth. And yet we turn to the right and to the left of God's commands all the time. God says, do this, don't do that. And we say, well, yeah, but I think I'm kind of justified to modify this a little bit or to modify that a little bit. God doesn't need your help with his commands. He doesn't. The Bible is not ours to modify how we choose. We must modify our lives to fit the Bible, not modify the Bible to fit our lives. And as believers in Jesus Christ, the Bible says we are servants of the Most High God. That's a high calling and a high responsibility. And we have to live up to that responsibility day by day. And we will always fail. There's not a person here that is going to serve God the way he deserves to be served. But every believer had ought to try their best. A faithful servant doesn't doubt or debate he just does as he is told. It's an easy thing, isn't it? I've had this with my kids growing up. As the kids grew up and as I grew up as a dad, where I would say to them, listen, this is what I need you to do. And I would say it in plain English. But somewhere in their little heads, they said, well, he can't possibly mean what he actually said. He must mean this. And so I would say plain English and they would still do something completely different. And I would say, why in the world did you? Well, you said that you did better. Yeah, I know. That's exactly what I said. Why didn't you do that? Well, because usually you want this or, or I thought maybe you wanted this or I thought it, that's not what. I needed from my kids at that time. God does not need for you to try and figure out what he meant by what he said. He just needs you to read, to do what he says, and to let him be responsible for the consequences of what you do as a servant. And there are consequences to serving God. There are consequences to obedience. And sometimes you feel like you are bearing the consequence of that obedience. But you know what? If that's what it takes, great, because you're in good company. Jesus, who was obedient to God, was obedient to death on the cross. And if God would not spare his own son, the cross, why do you think he would spare you? And if you say, well, then I'm not gonna obey him. Well, then you're going to go insane along with the rest of this world who has lost its mind. But if you want to come back to sanity, it starts with turning your face toward heaven. And it starts with saying to God, you're right. I was wrong. You're God. I'm just a man. And at least with that little seed of humility, you can begin to work on serving God as you were meant to. Fearing God means a healthy fear of him and yet longing for his grace. My kids have a healthy fear of me. 
now that they're grown ups, most of them, other than the one that's still in the house, that fear remains in the sense that they do not want to do anything that would hurt our relationship. I can safely say, at least for now, because I know life has its way of changing things around, but I can say safely as, as it is now, if my kids were to ever do something that they know I don't approve of, they would not be able to live with themselves. I can say that safely. They would not distance themselves from me, but they would long to be close to me, so much so they would come to hate whatever it was that they did that stood between me and them. This is how it should be with you and God. You should have a fear of God and a love of God that is so deep that if you sinned, you would come to hate that sin because it is separating you from being able to be happy in the presence of God and instead is making you miserable. Many a miserable, sinful Christian has avoided prayer and has avoided Bible study for exactly that reason. Because they're tired of apologizing to God for their sin. They're tired of going to God knowing that they're not worthy of being in his presence. They are tired of reading a Bible that tells them to be a lot better people than they really are. And they are sick and tired of feeling stupid. But listen, folks, we are the created beings. It is right and fit that in the presence of the creator, we should be as little children. It's right and fit. It is right and fit for us to go into the Lord's presence who is perfect in all of his ways, wanting of nothing and to feel foolish in his presence. It is right and fit for us. But our pride will not let us feel foolish. Our pride will not let us feel like children. And Jesus said, if anyone was to come to me, he must come to me as a little child. And that was not because he was trying to tell you, you have to alter yourself. He was saying, you have to come to me honestly as you are. Sinful, imperfect, a human being, not a God. And when you have that good fear of God, my goodness, it changes your relationship with him. When you come before him and you admit that you are everything he said you are. Take a look at Psalm 123 verses 1 and 2. <coughs> if I can get my pages to stop sticking together. I lift up my eyes to you. To you who sit enthroned in heaven as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress so our eyes look to the lord our god until he shows us his mercy ponder what we just read Proud man, proud woman, you would say to God, I am no slave and I have never been a slave. And if God wants to make me his slave, he can forget it. And proud man, proud woman, you were already shut out of heaven. What makes you think that you have just won over God's heart with your pride? 
you will remain shut out of heaven, shut out into darkness, shut out into foolishness, separation, and perdition for the rest of your life, cut off from everything that is good, cut off from the light of God, cut off from all hope, living as the devils live. My goodness, how could we but look to God as a slave looks to their master's hand and humbly wait on him? A slave never looks his master directly in the face. A slave looks at the hand of the master and says, please, please, please. How humble are you before the Lord? How contrite are you before God? Do you just rattle off a prayer? Well, God, I'm going to work today. Be there with me. Do you go to God and demand that he give you things? God! I wanted that promotion and I didn't get it. And I prayed and asked you, and if you're not going to give me what I want, why fooey on you? Many a Christian have prayed such prayers, thinking that somehow they were going to win the attention of their God, only to find out that he is unmoved and unshaken by such demands upon him. Sanity's evidence is found in praise to God. When the sanity returned to, Nic to um, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar turned and began to worship the Lord. Real praise isn't flattery, it's love, respect, and reverence. 29.13 of Isaiah, God says these peoples, are honoring me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God is not fooled by your flattery. Tell him all you want, how great he is and how wonderful and how mighty he is. If you don't live like he is great and wonderful and mighty, it's flattery. Do you really think that the holy God is beneath you to be flattered by you, to be manipulated by you, to be controlled by you? Not at all. Real praise is about who God is and not about how he has served you. Look at Psalm 92. In verse 5 we read, How great are your works, Lord! How profound are your thoughts! This psalmist is not flattering the Lord. He is studying the works of God, reflecting on all that God has done. And he can't imagine a God that can part the Red Sea. He can't imagine a God that can deliver a nation from an army of 135,000 with a committee of 300. This psalmist is looking back and is thinking of all of the times that God raised up men and women to deliver them and to deliver their nation. And this psalmist is going, wow, you're really blowing my mind. 
I can't imagine the process of thought that you have because the processes of thought that we have always result in disaster. This psalmist does not look for an educated man to deliver him from his torment. This psalmist looks for a God that has nothing to do and no investments in the human race. A God whose only investment is his own kingdom. A God whose only consideration is for those who are related to his son, Jesus. Let's go back there, okay. Humility is sanity. Belonging to God means he owns your mind, but loving God means you gladly give it to him. You can push back on him. I want to think for myself. Go ahead, think for yourself. Nobody's stopping you. Nobody is making you do anything. Nobody's making you become a Christian. Nobody is forcing you to live your life as a servant of God. But know this, if you are not a slave to righteousness, you are a slave to sin. And that master cannot deliver you from hell. Nor can he deliver you from the wrath of God. God's wrath is on sin, make no mistake about it. We live in a period of grace unprecedented in the history of mankind. A period of grace purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are either going to continue in that grace for eternity or we are going to make a decision that if the price of God's grace is our pride that it is not worth it to us. Make a decision. Are you proud and haughty man and woman and child? Are you going to persist in the idea that you have it and that you're going to live your life the way you want? If so, know this, you will face a God who will say, depart from me, I never knew you. But enjoy these 80 or so years you have. But if you, man or woman or child, are willing to humble yourself and are willing to say to God, you are God in heaven and I am just here on earth. You are the creator of all, and I am just a created thing. You are the master of all, and I am but a servant. If you are willing to say that and willing to approach him with that kind of humility, then you may gain a relationship with him. And in gaining that relationship, a servant to God, listen to me, a servant to God is a greater man, woman, or child than the greatest man or woman or child that ever lived without him on the face of this earth. The lowliest servant of God is greater than a king or a prince. What decision are you going to make? Do you want to live a sane life, live for God. Last of all, worshiping God requires humility, love, and knowledge. God created all minds and therefore he owns all minds, even those that do not honor him. And he will dispose of those minds as he sees fit. But we as Christians lovingly give our minds to him, which means knowledge is part of our worship. And reading our Bible and knowing what we can about God. And if we don't, if we don't read 
uh, for some reason, whether our eyes have gotten too, uh, too glazed over, or there are some people even in my generation that graduated early because they wanted to go to work. They weren't wanting to stay in school. It's always helpful to have someone else read to you or to have an audio Bible on a CD or whatever that you can listen to. But gain knowledge of the word of God. Gain knowledge. Worship him in humility and in love. He may own my mind, but because I love him, I gladly give it to him. I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I want my sanity. I do not want to be as Nebuchadnezzar and push and push and push and push against God until finally it drives me insane. I would rather be as the Nebuchadnezzar we read of at the end of Daniel chapter 4, one who acknowledges God and who says that his kingdom extends from generation to generation and that he is above all things. That is sanity. <laughs>